truths that, that John the Revelator was, was speaking to the early church and was sharing with them so they could take hold that through whatever they would go through, the trials and tribulations of life, they would have a heavenly perspective. Because how many of you know when you're in this world, in this life, it can be dark, it can be bleak, it can be messy. But as we allow God's word to come alive within us, as we begin to look, and what John was doing is, is God and Jesus himself was giving John a, a perspective to help us lift up above and see the world, see it all around us through heaven's eyes. And to see who Jesus is fully was. And so if you wonder what the book of Revelation, not Revelations, Revelation is all about, it's revealing who Jesus is. It's revealing who God is and the miraculous blessings and promises that we have in Him. Today we're jumping into chapter 4. We're going to hit this whole chapter here. It's 11 verses. Verse 1, then as I looked, this is John, I saw a door standing open in heaven. And the same voice I had heard before spoke to me like a trumpet blast. The voice said, come up here and I will show you what must happen after this. And instantly I was in the spirit and I saw a throne in heaven and someone sitting on it. And this is kind of an interesting key piece in uh, this is this epic tale that's taking place. In a lot of ancient literature, there were stories of, of people trying to get access to, to heaven, trying to get access to the gods. And there was often like uh, riddles and things and puzzles they would have to try to figure out. And there was always this, this odyssey, this journey of trying to get to God. And all of a sudden, but we see something different here. We see God just saying, open invitation. The door is open. There's no secret door. We have revealed an open door to the very presence of God. Jesus was that, that open door that you could just simply hear, and God was simply saying, I am here. Come to me. And instantly, he was in the throne room of heaven. No tricks, no scandals, nothing he had to do to earn it. He was invited and instantly there in the throne room of heaven. And I love it. And someone was sitting on it. Verse 3. The one sitting on the throne was as brilliant as gemstones, like jasper and carnelian. And if you need to, you can Google those later. And the glow of an emerald circled his throne like a rainbow. And I think I forgot to put it in. I was trying to imagine what that would look like. And so I was Googling, and I saw some of the most brilliant, beautiful Aurora Borealis pictures. It's just this green going through the sky. And it just hit me. I was like, that is just a fraction of the beauty and the glory that, that John was seeing. And sometimes people can, we can read into this a little too literally and think there's this, this, there's this actual throne and that there's this actual sea of glass. And what really what John is doing is he's giving a picture. How do you describe the presence of God? Something that's infinite, something that's beyond comprehension. You use things that we can best describe. He says it's like these things. And what he's really trying to do is he's trying to get us a handle on the glory and the majesty that is the presence of God. And I love this, though. Notice a very key thing here. How many of you know when we see uh, pictures of earthly kings and, and rulers, there's always this, sometimes this big, ornate throne, just gold, or the Vikings, they try to be scary, and there's all these big bones coming behind them and swords, and there's always this pomp, and, and this, the things around them are giving glory to the person sitting on the throne. There's a sense of you're not really anybody until you take the throne and, and then you get all that glory put on you. What we're seeing here, it's not the throne that's spectacular. It's not the things around it that, that is making the one sitting on the throne glorious. It is the one sitting on the throne who is glorious. The one sitting on the throne was as brilliant as gemstones. It wasn't that there were all these gemstones on the throne like, wow, the one sitting on the throne was as brilliant as gemstones. And there was this majesty, this, just this divine glow. 
emanating around the throne. Verse 4, 24 thrones surrounded him, and 24 elders sat on them, and they were all clothed in white and had gold crowns on their heads. I love this, this picture here. And what was showing, we've already seen earlier that, that those that persevere, those that remain in Christ, receive the victor's crown. Those that remain in Christ will receive robes of white, as we saw before. These are the, the saints of God. And, and some people, well, why, why 24? That's kind of weird. Well, you had 12 tribes, you had 12 disciples. And so there's this idea of 12. But then, so you have kind of this before. Um, Jesus, and after the, the Old Covenant, the New Covenant, you have the Jews and the Gentiles. And so there's this picture of whether you're Jew or whether you're Gentile, everyone, everyone in Christ who has received those robes of righteousness, have received the reward through Christ, they sit as heirs with God on his, around his throne. It's this promise, this, this 24 is a picture of all of the body of Christ, all that, that are in him have not only access, but we sit with him in his throne room, in his presence. And we saw that before in the earlier uh, pictures where Jesus says, I am the key holder to the palace. I am the one who has direct, allows direct access to the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. And we see the beautiful picture of this being lived out in this image. And then verse 5. From the throne came flashes of lightning and the rumble of thunder. And in front of the throne were seven torches with burning flames. This is the sevenfold Spirit of God. In front of the throne was a shiny sea of glass sparkling like crystal. Again, as a possible, the sevenfold Spirit, a possible reference to Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2, which give the seven divine attributes that the Messiah would have with them, meaning that the full presence of God would be in the Messiah, that Jesus was both fully man, fully God, would have the full presence. And so those seven torches around the, the throne is, is letting us know the full presence of God sits on this throne. The fullness of who God is, is on this throne. And think about that. The fullness of who God is is around that throne, and we have the promise to sit there with Him. And you see these flashes of lightning, this thunder, and I, just this picture of just how God's presence ripples through creation. Just this sound and the awe and the wonder. How many of you have been in a really good thunderstorm? Some of you, I love a good thunderstorm. I hear the crackling of the thunder, and, and it's one of my life goals to maybe, not dangerously, but be in a, a hurricane at some point. There's just something that, just in the air, you feel that, and to know that that is just a minute minuscule part of God's power and might. The power of God that birthed, that breathed, that exploded this universe into being, that we hear those cracklings, we hear remnants, we hear a revelation of, of just the glory and a reminder of the awe and power of God. So in this picture, he's, he's hearing that, he's seeing that, it's reminding of this, of just the power and the glory of who God is. Continuing on in verse 6 here, in the center and around the throne were four living beings. Now, this is going to sound really weird, kids. You ready? In the center around the throne were four living beings, each covered with eyes front and back. The first of these living beings was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had a human face. And the fourth was like an eagle in flight. Each of these living beings had six wings, and their wings were covered all over with eyes, inside and out, day after day and night, day after night, they kept on saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, the one who always was, who is, and who is still to come. And we, we saw that picture in in the beginning of Revelation, where Jesus said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. All of creation is singing this out in verse 9. Whenever the living beings give glory and honor and thanks to the one sitting on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down and worship the one sitting on the throne. 
the one who lives forever and ever. And they lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and they exist because you created what you please. And I love we see the picture of the, those 24, that idea of we receive the crowns, we, we receive that glory of God upon us, but yet it's not our glory, is it? The, the beauty, the, the gift of walking and being in God's presence, it's not us, it's not what we've done. The, we, the righteousness we have is the righteousness of Christ. And so this, this, honor, this idea of, and these, these weird beasts with all the eyes, what it's giving us a picture of is all of creation is constantly seeing and giving witness to the glory of God and who He is. And when we as God's people, when we, we see God's glory reflected in His creation, when we see it that all of creation, the animals don't have to be reminded Jesus said, if you don't, the rocks themselves, creation itself in its brilliance is, is revealing. It reflects just the, the divine intellect, the beauty of God. And when we are reminded by that, we are to be like, yes, God, you alone are worthy. You alone. It's not about me. It's about you. You created these things. And, and we lay our crowns, all those things of, that have been put upon us, pride, all that. We just set it down at his feet because he deserves all of it. Even that reward of, of, I just love that picture as we persevere in Christ, we hang on to Him, we, we share in His victory. And just in that moment, we remember, yes, it is through Him, and we put that all at His feet. And we see day and night, all of creation is, is seeing the beauty and the glory and the splendor of who God is. And, and every time God's people would see this, they would put their crowns. And what a beautiful reminder to us that in any moment of our life, if anything sparks, reminds us of who God is, of His glory, what He's done, in that moment we are to worship Him. So as we look at those passages, I just want us to unpack a little bit this morning. This idea, and so our big idea this morning is kind of this, see God, be in awe of Him, and worship Him. And one of the big things that we are supposed to take away from this chapter is, is just the glory of who God really is. He's the creator of all. He sustained, we saw that in the earlier passages, that through Him everything was made. But I want to challenge us this morning that, and I think John was so important that he would remind the early church that they would go through some hard, difficult, ugly times in this life. And he was reminding them, he's giving them a glimpse of the promise that they fully have. And this idea that if all of creation, even now, is seeing the glory and the splendor of God and revealing Him, and we see those 24 elders representing it's supposed to be us. As we see it, we are to be doing the same thing. What are we called to do? We are called to see the glory and the wonder of God and to worship Him and to join with all of creation and declare who He is. We are to live lives of worship. Creation around us is worshiping God. As the stars are moving and, and burning and, and throwing off this magnitudes of power, they're revealing glimpses of God. In creation and science, God, we see God's beauty, His, His handiwork revealed. From the smallest dust particle to the largest stars in the universe, it's all a miracle. It's all a, a work of of God. Flowers, plants, animals, even the dangerous and ugly ones are miraculous. Now don't look at your neighbor and say even you are miraculous. The reflection of the goodness of the glory of God is all around us. We are to open our eyes and see. 
We saw earlier in the passages, those with ears to hear, hear what the Spirit has to say. And now we're starting to see a picture where to see with our eyes as well, see what God is doing. Listen to His voice, reveal what you see. May we be overtaken in awe of who God is, and may we join with all of creation and worship Him. Not only in, in creation, but just in the beauty and the life around us. And if you've seen little kids playing and you've seen the puppies, and there's so much good in life that I just encourage us that we forget we can be so busy in our modern lives and we're doing this. And, and yes, modern technology is great. We can preach off of it. But nothing compares to just sitting and talking to God and just enjoying with Him creation that is around us. We see that picture of God creating the world and on that seventh day resting. and He wanted to enjoy creation. Man was supposed to rest as well. God rests because we are to enjoy creation with God because God is, it reminds us of who He is. That on that splendor of Him. So I want us to get an idea of what does it really mean to, to live a life of worship? What does it mean to worship? And we can hit on that a little bit of, we see that picture in the throne room of heaven. They're declaring who He is. They're declaring God's value, His worth, immeasurable, holy, holy, holy. And so worship really means to, to ascribe worth or value to something. And so if you go on and on about how great something is and how important it is in your life, it's a <coughs> excuse me, it's like an act of worship. And so when we have things in our lives that we value, and we go on and on about, we focus on more than we focus on God, what are we truly worshiping in our life? And so we are called like the, the beasts we see around this throne that are continually worshiping God as we see the picture of God's people that is also our call that as we, as we become aware of who He is, as we become aware of the value of who God is within us, we are to worship Him. And so here's a few ways this morning just in which we worship Him with our lives. One, we worship God with our minds. We think about God. We think about the beauty that is around us of what He has done, His creation. We think of, of Christ's uh, birth and, and His life and His death and resurrection. We think upon these things. And we allow ourselves to wonder and to desire to know more and more about God's creation, to know more and more about Him, to know Christ more and more intimately each and every day. And how do you know if you have an infinite God... We're not going to ever get to a point until we stand directly in front of Him. There's always something a little bit more to know. There's a little bit deeper to know Christ, to know who God is, to desire and to wonder to know God more. The more intimately we begin to know who God is, the greater and more sincere our worship will be. If you show me a Christian who struggles to worship, I'll show you a Christian who has yet to fully open their eyes and accept and see who God is. There's so many things in this life that we can allow to blind us. It's so easy to have our eyes fixed on, on the things, the death and the chaos and the destruction of this world, the things that God has defeated that we forget to fix our eyes on Him, the author and perfecter of our faith and, and the hope that we have. Part of worship is to desire, to seek, to, to want to know who Jesus is, to want to know who God is more and more. So we worship God with our minds. So I want to, I always encourage Christians, some of meet Christians, they're like, man, I have so many questions and doubts about this and that, and how does God, and I feel like I'm, I'm like, no, God's given us 
intellect. He's given us questions to ask. The only time the questions are bad is when we aren't willing to sit and sit and sit in God's presence and allow His Spirit to speak to us and transform us and change us. When we look for the answers everywhere else, but instead of God's Word, instead of in Christ. A lot of people have great questions. There's a lot of people in my generation are walking away from church, they're walking away from faith because they have great questions, but they're looking for the answers in all the wrong places. We worship God with our lives, so with our minds, with our intellect, but also with our, our physicality, with the aspects of our lives, how we work our jobs. Work is unto the Lord. How we love and care for our families, how we love and care for our neighbors, how we love and care for our enemies. These are all ways that we worship God and we are declaring. So when the world around us says, man, you're such an amazing person. And we can say, no, I'm not. And we take that crown off and we say, but Jesus is. And this is coming from him. And he gets the glory. And in that moment, we are worshiping God. When we allow the Holy Spirit to transform us and shape us and how we are to live our lives as Christ has taught us and is calling us to, those moments in our lives become moments of of us becoming part of creation, declaring the goodness, faithfulness, and splendor of who God is and how much He loves us and His faithfulness and His kindness, which leads us to repentance. We worship God with our creativity, and some people make music, some people make wood signs, and some people play the spoons. I don't know. But God has given us all, some people say, I'm not really creative. No, we're all creative in different ways. We all have different skills and abilities and different quirks and different things that that, uh, make us unique. And those unique things are part of what we can allow to use, give to God, and allow to be to His glory. How boring would it be if God had allowed us all to come up and be exactly the same? We worship God with our voices and our bodies. And I love this picture. We see all of creation, all of God's people around His throne singing and crying out to Him. I love that every one of us, it doesn't say if you're a good singer, it doesn't say if you can play instruments, Every single one of us, as part of God's creation, is called to sing out to Him. We are called to to raise our hands to worship Him. If you have a voice, sing out, even if it doesn't sound too good. Just maybe at a moderate level. (laughs) God delights in the praises of His people. As we pray, as we sing, as we declare who He is, it's not as much that God needs to know who He is, but it reminds us of who He is. If you have hands, I encourage you to clap them. If you have arms, raise them. If you have feet, move them. We see all through the Old Testament, all through, and sometimes different cultures have different ways of expressing themselves, and we've uh, joked about that very northern uh, Germanic, uh, many of us backgrounds, and it can be hard to, to move your feet. And some of you are like, I'm really dancing pretty hard right now. And I challenge us that don't worry about the outside so much, because sometimes you can be people that are just shouting and yelling, Woo, praise Jesus! But in the inside, they're just trying to get attention. What God's looking at us in the inside, I just challenge us, Are we crying out on the inside? Whether it's in that quiet place, are we are we saying, are we just allowing God to within our mind and through his word just to take us to the place where we say, God, help show me who you are? Are we allowing the Holy Spirit to remind us of who we're not? 
to remind us how much we need Him, how much we need His grace and His forgiveness and His mercy. And when, when we ha- focus on that, we're like, God, You are amazing. God, I don't deserve what You are doing in me. I don't deserve the, the, what You have done for me. But God, because You are amazing, because I love You, because of what You've done for me, I'm going to continue on. I'm going to cling to You. I'm going to declare who You are to those around me. And as we do that, there's that, that spirit within us just builds And I would encourage us, even if you don't have a voice, or hands, or arms, or legs, that even in our minds and our hearts, we are to do all those things and worship God with all our heart, mind, and soul. With our whole being. So wherever we are, when we find ourselves aware of God's presence, and you know we've learned that God's presence is everywhere. It can be revealed in every moment. But wherever we are, when we find ourselves aware of God's presence and the revelation of Him around us, may we always take the time to join in with the rest of creation and worship Him.